Welcome, everyone. It's great to see you here in another Airbase Path to Becoming a CFO uh, webinar series. And we have a special guest today, Mike Scarpelli, the CFO of Snowflake. Welcome, Mike. Thank you for having me today, Jeff. Uh, Mike has had an incredible career, not one, not two, but three incredible technology success CFO stories, starting with Data Domain, then ServiceNow, and now Snowflake, which, of course, is the iconic, incredibly successful cloud software company, and we'll hear all about it. But Mike, I'd like to start off with something early in your career. You started at PwC, so you were a public auditor, and you joined a company at a time when it had more challenges than maybe you thought. Can you just tell that story of leaving public accounting, going to your first finance internal finance role, and what happened next? Sure, um, and I'll, 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 I'll say one thing too. I started at Coopers and Libran. I'm very, uh, Coopers and oh, Libran is where I made partner. And then we merged with PW. So yes, PWC. Oh, there you go. Um, I always joke with some of my former partners I still keep in touch with, and we still um, miss the Coopers and Libran days. But um, anyway. Well, it's the C, it's they kept the C. Right? Yes, they kept the C. The That's only true. reason they kept the C is because they didn't want the, they were gonna do WC, and they didn't think that was an appropriate acronym in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, anyways, uh, yeah, no, I was a um, audit partner at um, PwC and, you know, I was made partner in Canada. And when I was in Canada, we used to do a lot more of the work. It wasn't just being an audit partner. I did a lot of M&A support transaction services. But when they moved me to the Bay Area, I was really just focused. You had to choose. And I love the client relationships. And so um, I stuck with the audit track, and then I quickly realized this isn't what I wanted to do for the next um, 25 years. And I joined a company, which I never joined to go be the CFO. That was never my intent. My real passion, I used to love doing M&A support. So I actually joined a company called HPL Technologies to run corporate development. And it was a very acquisitive, small company. But what industry was it in? What, what product? It was yield optimization software for the semiconductor industry. And um, there were, I, I joined that company um, looking at doing a number of M&A deals. And I was six months into that, had closed three transactions, I think, and had three other term sheets and uncovered a massive fraud um, within the company. And it was more, the auditors were calling me and asking me questions. And I'm like, well, that doesn't seem right. And then I started digging into it. And what was interesting about that is um, the CEO ends up fleeing the country and because he fled the country, um, and I was the one that called the board and the outside counsel in, because he fled the country, I didn't realize this, but the FBI got involved, <laughs> which was quite interesting. And I had to deal with three and a half years of dealing with the DNO carriers rescinding policies. All the executives got fired, but me, half the board got terminated. Had to deal with DNO carriers rescinding policies. I had to deal with derivative actions in state court. Had to deal with securities litigation in federal court, SEC, and uh, uh, NASDAQ, and going through a delisting. So it was quite a. It was a challenging time because I was I had my first child was literally born a month and a half before all this happened, and um, um, it um, was probably. At the time, I thought the biggest mistake in my life leaving PwC, but in hindsight, it was probably the best experience that I've ever had in terms of what I learned from a legal perspective. I had to go through a massive riff in the company that I had to make quick decisions on to preserve capital in the company. And um, that really set me up for my next role that I went into was a company called Lexar Media which once again, I joined that company because the auditors were actually contemplating resigning. And they actually came to me and said, if you come in and clean this up, we will stick around. And that was a challenging thing. Literally the first day I joined January 2nd, 2006, was my first meeting was with the CFO who did not know he was being replaced. And I had to inform him and deal with that. And that was another interesting company because that was really the start of activism within Elliot. That was, if any of you know Jesse Cohen, you've probably heard of, um, he got involved in that deal. And this was really his first real activist deal, as well as Carl Icahn and Glenview Capital, who are known activists and had to deal with 
Um, there were a number of things happening in that company, and ultimately we sold it to Micron, which um, was the best thing for the company. And um, then I was trying to decide. I was talking to two other public companies that wanted me to come in, and I won't give their names, that wanted me to come in and um, kind of fix things within their company that there was some stuff they weren't happy about. And I just decided I'm sick and tired of cleaning up other people's messes for the last five years. I'd rather build. And so I made the decision, I'm going to go to a startup company. I'll forgo the cash compensation I was getting and do the startup with the role of equity. And um, I um, ended up meeting Frank Slootman at um, Data Domain through a recruiter. I would never have heard of Data Domain. And I was looking at a number of other companies at the time, and I really just chose to work with Frank because he and I think the same way. And um, he's also a CEO that does not um, claim to know everything about finance. Um, really what attracted him to me was he wanted to take data domain public. He had no one on his executive team that had ever been an officer of a public company. They really didn't have any infrastructure and he hired me to come in and build that infrastructure and take the company public. So I think we were on file with the SEC six months to the date that I joined um, the company, even though I think the board was shocked. They didn't think we would be able to go public as quickly as we did. Um, and, um, you know, going public is actually not hard. It's actually pretty easy. It's just time consuming. <laughs> um, and it's just really, and as I tell people that are looking to take a company going public, the most important thing is the project management of the process and holding everyone accountable to what they need to do. It's not difficult. It's just you need to be a driver and don't let any of the schedule slip. And I think that was the key. And so took data domain public, ultimately sold that to or EMC. I stuck around at EMC for almost two years after trying to, I was working on um, being responsible for the West Coast finances for EMC, but I quickly realized that's not what I wanted to do. And then Frank joined ServiceNow and he called me and literally the day he got his offer, I got my offer like a week later. And then I gave EMC a hundred day transition and then I joined ServiceNow and um, once again, had that on file almost literally six months from the date that I joined the company. Once again, it had nothing to do about me. It was about just driving people and um, make, holding people accountable. Um, and then I, um, Frank left service now and literally two years after he left service now and he pretty much left data domain two years, um, he approached me on snowflake and I was actually going to just retire at the end of December of 19. And, um, he convinced me if I would do it with him, he would do it again. And I joined, I would have had it on file six months to the date that I joined, but unfortunately COVID happened and we didn't become public until I joined in August of 19. We were public in September of 2020. And I think the really unique thing about the three companies, Data Domain, ServiceNow and Snowflake, um, the success of those companies has nothing to do with me. It's all about the great product. And I think it's really important that everyone understand to have a successful company, you need a great product. And it's really those, a great product in a market where you have a real competitive differentiator over anyone. And I'll kind of stop there. Wow, what what a career and what a story. Let's go back to the beginning. So uh, tell us, where did you grow up? Uh, when, what, when you were a child, did you want to be an astronaut or a fireman or what were you, <laughs> you a CFO? And, you know, I, I grew up in Sarnia, Ontario, Canada, a small town about three hours from Toronto, a border town of Port Huron, Michigan. And, you know, I really never knew what I was going to do, even when I went to college. The only reason why I went to college is I wanted to get the hell out of the house and be away from my, like a lot of kids at that stage, when you're 18 years old, you want to get away from your parents. And um, I was actually thought initially I was going to go down the medicine route. In my first year of college, I took all the courses you need to do kind of for that pre-med, and I did extremely well. But I just decided it wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I had always worked my way through high school. And even um, in, in the summers, I worked a lot. But even when I was in first year university, I would go home a lot on weekends and worked. And I worked for this company that um, literally owned two stores that sold produce, fruits and vegetables and other things. And 
Um, I was very close to one of, there were three young owners. I was close to one of them. I used to do all the buying at the Ontario Food Terminal. The Detroit Food Terminal actually drove the transports and summers and stuff and did all that. And the one owner was leaving and the other who did all the buying and the two other owners wanted to hire me out of college and to do it full time and work with them. And I remember I seriously thought about it because at the time, this is back in 1986 or whatever, they were offering me $50,000 a year to start and a profit sharing and all this stuff. And I, um, I want to do it, but my father is like, there is no way you're ever going to do that. And so I said, fine. I actually switched universities, went to the University of Toronto and um, three, four days a week, I got up at quarter to three in the morning. I went to the entire food terminal, did all the buying, got it loaded on the truck, went to school all day, came home, did the paperwork. And I rinsed and repeated that for a year. And then I quickly realized this is not what I want to do for the rest of my college life, <laughs> just working all the time and going to school. And I went back to Western and I decided, you know, I'm going to do an economics degree. And then I quickly realized that what am I going to do with an economics degree? And then I started taking finance and accounting courses. And I only chose finance and accounting because I grew up very, I would say, I don't even know if you want to call it middle class, but I never traveled, never did anything. And the accounting firms were all on campus recruiting and um, and they were pitching international work experience. And so I literally joined an accounting firm because I wanted the opportunity to work abroad. And I did that with Coopers and Library and I worked in um, Italy. Um, it was interesting when I was working in Italy, I went over there purely for the purpose of wanting to learn Italian better. I grew up when I was young, I could speak it not bad, but I wanted to learn that. So I chose Italy thinking I'm gonna be working with all these Italians and literally, Two weeks into being there, that's when Invest Corp was buying out the other share of um, Gucci. Like you probably saw the House of Gucci, that um, movie. Well, I lived through that. I was actually working for Invest Corp, but everything I did was in English. And once again, I was working seven days a week when I was there. And that's not what I signed up to go to Italy for. So I almost went to work for Invest Corp and Gucci. Both had offered me jobs, but I decided that's not what I want to do. And I went back to Canada and became a partner very quickly there. And that's kind of my history. Well, that's, that's pretty extraordinary. So you were, you were at uh, Cooper's and then PwC, you joined HPL Technologies and pretty quickly, you personally uncovered the fraud. Um, our auditors, PwC called me that they weren't getting the answers to what they wanted. And then I dug into it and started looking at, I was not the CFO and I started questioning the CFO and I wasn't getting the answers. And then I went in to the CEO's office and started questioning him on all these transactions and he said he'd get back to me the next day with all the support and then he fled the country that night and when I couldn't get a hold of him that night is when I called our external counsel and then the uh, chairman of the board and which initiated the everything and was the CFO involved in the fraud I would say she was um, not knowingly involved in it I would just say maybe incompetence. And it's kind of funny, I had already said, as soon as I joined the company that that CFO was not the right CFO, you needed someone else. And I understand why he wanted her. She was, I don't want to say anything bad about her because she's a super nice lady and I don't want to use her name, but she just was not a strong CFO and she needed to be replaced. I've and I think the reason he wanted her was to hide the fraud. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've talked to other people involved in or who were involved in uncovering fraud, and they said their initial reaction was disbelief. Like they saw numbers that sort of didn't quite make sense. It, they didn't immediately think it was fraud. They said there must be some explanation. And the, the more they uncovered, the, the the more problems they had. Is that what did it take you a while to jump to the how how long did it take from the time you first saw the the anomalies to the time you realized it, it was took me problem? about four hours. Of things. So what was the tell? What was the, you know, it, it, just some of the transactions did not make, there was no money stolen from the company, just a bunch of fictitious um, documentation on fabricating deals. And as I dug into it, looking at source documents, I'm like this, which PwC were questioning, um, made me really realize that something's wrong here. And that's why I initially went to the, um, the, the CEO. I have to tell you, the CEO was a really good storyteller and my bad for, I should have caught up caught this when I, so this made me a lot more skeptical of yeah. people. <laughs> um, so I generally will question any transaction a lot more so now than probably I did in the past, even when I was an auditor. 
it uh, always has to pass the smell test. Pro professional skepticism is a pretty important concept yes. skill for for an auditor for CFO. Yes, it's you know you don't you don't run into fraud very often, but when you do, it's pretty serious. And uh, yes. so in this case, it was they they fabricated revenue. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He actually put money into the company that he borrowed to cover those deals. No kidding. Yeah. And there was a circular of money and it was actually quite elaborate tracing the wires and stuff. Yeah. So follow the money, follow the cash. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so then, uh, you, you said Actually, I'll tell you a funny story. When he got out of jail, that um, CEO, he actually reached out to me about a year after he got out of jail, asking if I would invest in his next company. <laughs> I can't <laughs> believe that. True story. <laughs> he must have been a pretty good salesman and had a pretty high opinion of his persuasive ability. Yes. Yes. Needless okay. to say, I did not. <laughs> that's incredible. Well, that's a pretty good, good uh, postscript. So then through a recruiter, you met Frank Slootman, and, and you said that you and Frank think the same way. What, what do you mean by that? So Frank is likes to keep things simple. He likes to just, you know, as he always tells people, and this is what I tell people too, is you can't do everything at once. You just need to focus on a, a few things and do them really well. And Frank thinks that way too. And um, um, and he also believes in just kind of, and I believe in this, just deal with, you, you got to multitask, but when you just got to keep knocking things off that list and follow through on things. And Frank makes very quick decisions like me. Um, Frank is very customer focused. His whole thing is, and I firmly believe this too, is in any company, I believe it's customers first. And if you take care of your customers, your investors are going to be taken care of and your employees are going to be taken care of. It's not employees first because without customers, you have no company. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, we'll get back to your working with Frank in a minute, but I, I wanted to get back to the activist work you did earlier. You said you at one point interacted with both Jesse Cohen and Elliot and Carl Icahn. Yes. So two incredible personalities, obviously very successful in, in what yeah. they've done. Let's just start with Jesse. Did you, you have any thoughts about what was that experience like? Working well, actually, I think Jesse's a really smart individual. And I think he was 26 at the time of Lexar because I remember I had a few dinners with him and I actually became quite close to him. I actually didn't disagree with anything he was saying because I thought a lot of the same things. So, we, so you were the CFO of the company at that point? I, I, I was the CFO of the company and I didn't disagree with all the things he was saying. But the board presumably disagreed or the board didn't take action. The board, the, 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 the board did not take action initially and more the CEO did not take action on things. They quickly did come around. And then where Carl got really involved, Carl Icahn um, got really involved was when, um, I won't go through all the history, but anyways, we ended up deciding to sell the company to Micron and it had to go to a proxy vote. And Carl Icahn was against the deal and the reason he was against the deal is the company had a big award on a litigation with Toshiba. And I think it was the, at the time, back in 2006, it was the largest patent award. Um, at the time, it was like 480 million or something. And back then, that meant a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, we knew that was going to get appealed and we would lose on appeal um, internally. Even our lawyers were shocked that we got the award. And so we knew we were going to have to sell the company because there was going to be some cash issues. And we also knew what was happening with SanDisk and other things. And um, what was happening with Flash um, was the price of Flash was dropping dramatically. There was new controller technology for your Flash drives. Um, and so we made the decision to sell the Micron. Um, Carl Icahn did not think that value was enough. And so I had to go spend time with Carl Icahn to convince him why this was the right deal to do. And it was quite interesting meeting with um, Carl. At the time, I was kind of in awe of meeting him because of all the stories about him. But it was actually quite interesting meeting him. And um, ultimately, um, he was against the deal. And I remember when we were going through the vote, we were short deals. And I had to call him to see if I could convince him to change his price we got, or his mind, we ended up having to get Micron just to increase the price by a quarter <laughs> of a dollar. 
and that got us over the line with he still didn't vote for it, Carl, but it got it through with some other people. Um, and it was quite interesting that proxy vote went down to the 11th hour. And that was the right thing for Lexar to be sold. What was your impression of Carl? What did you learn from him? You know, I think he's a really, really smart financier. And he is, uh, he, he can be a little bit of a, he was really nice for me to deal with. But when in negotiations, like with Micron, he could be a little bit of a, a, a bully, I would say. He's definitely not a technologist and does not understand technology that well. But you wouldn't expect him to. I remember this was probably the most memorable thing is um, the real value in Lexar Media was the controller technology. And you have a controller with the flash to control your thumb drives or your SD cards. Our controller technology, we weren't even using it much. We were buying third-party controller technology, even though we had a lot of patents around controllers. Uh, it was too big. And I was showing Carl Icon. He wanted to understand more of the tech. And I'm showing him, this is what we own, the controllers. And that's where all of our patents are. And the flash, he literally said, look at the size of the controller versus the flash. It's bigger. It should be worth more. And I'm like, <laughs> no, no, no. Smaller is better. <laughs> yeah, I guess I see what you mean. He, said he didn't understand technology. So was there, what did he want the company? So he didn't want it to be sold. What did he, he want? It more money for the company. But oh, he didn't realize, and he thought there was value in that patent lawsuit with Toshiba, which we knew. And even at the end of the day, it, it, Micron put no value on that. And that ended up getting turned um, over and the company got nothing for it, I which see. we suspected we were going to get nothing for it. I would never see a dollar. That's that's interesting. So he just was going on instinct as opposed to information. Yeah. And it's funny, I've kept in contact with Jesse over the years. I will say the last few years, not as much. But um after that time, Jesse would always call me and ask me about companies. And then lo and behold, he's an activist on them. He's asked me twice to be his board representative on um, um, companies they went publicly active on. And I was like, Jesse, a sitting CFO, as a sitting CFO, I will never be your representative <laughs> on any board for an activist. I don't you necessarily disagree with you and I won't tell you the companies. I, I, I actually agreed with him. And all the ones that I've seen him do, I've actually agreed with his thinking on those. You know, that's a fascinating question. If when you retire at some point, if he invites you again, would you be a, a board member working with an activist? I'm never going to say no. It depends on the company. Um, and but you know, I have more than enough. I'd rather spend my time working with startups looking to go public that's the real value i can add to companies um yeah i could do it but i don't know it depends upon the company right well tell us about taking company public you said that it's it's not complicated it's just time consuming you have to have a project uh plan uh did you say you could do it in six months from a standing start i did service now and data domain in six months from joining the, and both companies i did an erp migration during that time as well too to SAP. From what to SAP? One went from QuickBooks, the other one went from NetSuite. No kidding. And did you have an outside consultant in both cases to help with the implementation? I used outside people, but the first thing I hired good IT people um, to do it. I'm not a big, I'm not a big believer and I've never used where a lot of companies will want to bring in a third party, whoever SOP projects or Moss Adams or something to come in and own all the sock stuff. I've always been a believer in we need to own it. I will use people to augment my staff, but at the end of the day, my people need to own it. And that means we run the project, we're doing it, not a never going to turn things over to a consultant to do. And that was the same thing too. I remember at Data Domain, the first thing I did when I made the decision, I want to go to um, SAP from QuickBooks. And I had looked at Oracle and SAP and I had just come off a big SAP or an Oracle migration at Lexar Media. And it was painful. And given what we were doing with the supply chain for our contract manufacturer, I wanted to tie into them. SAP made sense. I actually hired, when I was doing reference checks, I've done this a number of times, I'll ask SAP gave me some reference checks for similar companies and what they did, did reference checks. I met with the people. I ended up hiring one of the people I talked to. Um, and I had also brought him on to, when I left Data Domain, I brought him on to ServiceNow to do the 
SAP migration as well to a number of the people that I had. So you're thinking is it's important the, the, what the consultants offer is experience in having done this 20 times. Yes. But you can hire individuals as full-time employees who've done it several times and get the same experience. Correct. But then they work for you and then there's continuity. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. That is exactly the case. Yeah, I remember at Oracle, Oracle had not made acquisitions for most of its early life and then it bought PeopleSoft and and made an acquisition a month for the next 15 years. Uh, and what they did initially is I think they brought in Deloitte to help with the merger integration. And they said, you're going to do one project for us. You're going to help us with this merger integration and you're going to write playbooks and we're never going to hire you again because mm -hmm. we're going to have our team learn side by side with you to learn how to do it. And then yep. we're going to have the in-house capability. Uh, yes. so there was some value there. Have you ever, have, do you ever advise hiring consultants, strategy consultants or other kind of consultants? And have you found them valuable? Um, you know, I think the people that work at consulting companies are really good and I'd rather hire them. I am not a fan of, and I shouldn't say this because I have a bunch of partners. I personally do not like going engaging on a big project with on strategy. We know our business better than other people. And if we don't, I need to hire the people that know it. Um, I have done a little bit at ServiceNow, but that was driven more by when Frank left the CEO who believed in using consultants. But my personal opinion is, is consultants just tell you what you already know and are kind of a little bit of cover your ass on making your for making your decisions. Um, don't get me wrong. I think consultants are good when you're doing a big project and you need to augment your staff with people. They're really good on the IT side if you're doing it, for instance, we partner a lot with Deloitte, Accenture, emphasis on big Teradata migrations for our customers. That's good. But when it comes to the strategy, even I know Boston Consulting Group um, does a lot of helping companies around pricing and thinking through your pricing. Um, I believe we know our pricing and we need to we need to know it. So I'd rather hire those type of people um, than just turn a project over. Um, we have used them a little bit more because they're a customer and to appease them, but um, <laughs> I'm not a big, um, I'm not a big, there's been zero big consulting projects I've handed over to them. I've had KPMG come in and do a security assessment um, because we want to get a third party evaluation on our security posture, but it's okay. a very defined project, not a really expensive project. That's where I think it can make sense to use consultants to come in. Right. Uh, that question about consultants came from JW, who who referred to Frank Slutman's book, Amp It Up, which is an incredible book. So, uh, and we're now, we're, oh, feel free to ask questions. The people in the audience, we're all happy to, if you put it in chat, I'll I'll uh, get to the questions. Uh, I wanted to follow up on uh, the, something you said about the IPO project management, which is you, you set a deadline and, and timetables, and then you hold people accountable. Uh, what's What have you found works most effectively when you say, hold people accountable? How do you actually do that in practice? Um, well, in the case of the data domain IPO, I was actually rolling my sleeves up and working out there and driving people. I remember I, I remember one weekend, we're in a drafting session on a Saturday and I had all the lawyers and everything. And the one head lawyer on the other side says, I can't come tomorrow. And I'm like, that's okay. And he said, well, we're not going to do the session. And I just, I won't give you the name of the law firm. And I said, the last time I checked, I didn't hire. And I said his name. I hired the firm and get someone else out here. <laughs> <laughs> and I just kept, and people were, I don't mean to say this. I think at that time, I had probably had instilled a bit of fear in people. And they were all, I led by example, though, that I was literally at every single drafting session, rolling my sleeves up. You have to remember at that time, I probably had two lawyers in the company and 10 people in my finance group and were really the ones who drove that. Right. Um, so did that particular partner show up or did it? Did, did he, he showed up the next day. Yeah. <laughs> so all it is is to say, these are my expectations and I'm going to be, and like a good thing, expectations, day, you were there. Yeah. And, and I will say in the data domain case, because that was still my, even though when I was in my public accounting days, I worked on piles of IPOs. I worked on piles of debt financing. Actually, being in-house owning it is very different. Um, I did rely a lot on 
um, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley at the time, probably a little bit too much on taking their lead on what to do on certain things, especially when it came time to pricing. The ServiceNow one, I definitely did not rely on them as much. And at the Snowflake one, I'm like, before I even engaged bankers, I had everything drafted and said, here, this is the S1 we're going with. Oh, really? And, yeah. And I learned too, in the data domain one, I let too many bankers have an opinion in the drafting session. In the ServiceNow one, I limited to two bankers. And it was literally, I think, um, two days before we um, filed it is when I turned it to all the banks to give comments. And I made it very clear. I only want substantive comments, no wordsmithing. And you have more than enough time to get it through your committees. Um, and in the Snowflake one, I literally just dealt with one banker pretty much right to the end. And in the Snowflake one, in the early days, the data domain one, I pretty much let the bankers do all the allocations. In the ServiceNow one, I built up a more relationship with investors and I knew who the good investors are and the ones I wanted. I, I had a say in the Snowflake one, literally, I allocated 100% of those shares where they went. Well, let's follow up on allocations. I, on, I've been on boards of companies that went public a few years ago, and we've talked a lot about the allocations. And the theory is that you you sell stock to the long only funds that are going to be long term shareholders. And, and then I said, you know, I, I've never actually seen the data about whether that's true. And so we went back six months later after they after the lockup expired and, and the next public filing and the, the company had done very well, the stock went up. And we went back and we looked at all the people who got stock in the IPO, who still owned it six months, six months and 10 days later. Uh, it was very few, probably only 20% of the original owners held their stock. Everyone else had sold for 100% premiums. Snowflake IPO was one of the most successful in history. Did you ever go back and look to see whether by giving an allocation to these long-term holders, did they stay long-term holders or not? Yeah. So... Um my big shareholders are still pretty much the ones that got the biggest allocations in the mm -hmm. IPO. But I think an important distinction is you can't just sell, you can't just allocate too long only because you're never going to create a market in your stock. You need to allocate a piece to you know who are the people who believe in your story, but will sell to create that market. Or else I, I, uh, true story. When we did the, and this is what, and once again, this isn't me or anything, but, uh, you know, we knew we had, could have priced Snowflake's IPO bigger, but what I wanted to do is to price it at a point where those long only guys that I was allocating to would come into the market and buy up to a certain price when they do their weighted average price. I knew what their target was. And I knew at the time we priced it 120 bucks. I knew there were a bunch of people that kind of had viewed it at 180 bucks. And so I never expected us to go up as high as we did, but I did see it going to 180 at the time, given the market the way it was. Um, but if you recall, when we went public, we, it took us quite a while to open. And the reason it took us quite a while to open, no one was willing to sell, even the people that we thought would sell. And I remember I'm on calls with Goldman and the capital markets people, and we're literally on calls with one guy and they had one guy who was willing to sell, but they said they would only sell if Scarpelli knew they were selling uh, because he was afraid. <laughs> was they wanted your permission. I'm like, sell. Yeah. We need, a, we need to create a market. I never told anyone you can't sell. Yeah. Well, in hindsight, uh, are you happy with how it went or because there's always a trade off of you want the IPO to be successful. You want to, to the press and the perception that that the company is more valuable. On the other hand, there's a pretty strong argument that you left a lot of shareholder money on the table and you just gave it as a gift to the people who bought in the IPO and you could have made billions of dollars more by uh, going out with a higher price. How, how do yeah. you think about that trade? I, you know, I really think that people who make those arguments that you've left money on the table are kind of naive and you're in this for the long haul. And it's such a small piece of dilution um, to the company at the end of the day. And it's really, you want your investors to make money. And because then they're willing to buy more and to support you more in, in, in tougher times. If you try to maximize for the, um, the, the, the maximum price 
um, you're going to lose a lot of good investors for the long haul. And you need those good investors for when your lockup is coming off to be in there buying stock. And so I am happy with that. But, you know, the, the biggest thing for me and what's important in an IPO is you do want a stock. You do want to pop in your stock price. Yeah, we popped way more than I could have expected. But I think that was more an indication of the markets at the time and the euphoria that was going on. And, you know, the cost of capital was pretty much zero and people needed a place to put ca capital. But that pop in stock price makes your employees feel good that they're with a successful company. Not the reality, nothing changed from the company, but that reaction that um, uh, the morale in employees is unbelievable when you have a successful IPO. It also caused it so, such a branding event for Snowflake. We were on the news all the time and all the, the newspapers and stuff. That really opened up brand awareness for Snowflake. And I don't think we would have had that if we weren't as successful in terms of the, the way that we trade it and the price of the stock. Do I like the idea that the stock dropped in price the way that it has? You know, the whole market has come down and I knew we were overvalued. I remember before going public, I was convincing engineers that uh, when we're trying to hire key engineers coming out of Google and I was putting my valuation models. Now it tells you why I'm not a valuator as I was coming down that 85 bucks a share was a fair price that I thought we could get to in one to two years. I was not expecting that we would have priced at 120, but the markets were crazy at the time. And um, so would I change anything? No, I think it's, I'm, I'm very happy with where I am. I'm happy with our shareholder base in the company. Um, but even when we were going through our first year and doing our AMS, our, our AMR, our annual merit review and refresh grant for modeling purposes, I was never using our current stock price as the price. It was a much lower price is what I thought, because I knew that was going to pull back and as interest rates were going to go up, that was going to impact that. Well, Mike, when, you, when you're in a situation like this where your stock goes way up, but then comes down with the market and as hundreds of other tech company stocks have, how do you think about stock-based compensation and whether employees understand what the stock is worth? How do they, you have one employee who joined one day and they're at a certain strike price and employee joins a year later at a different strike price. Yeah. How, what What's the optimal way to run a business in terms of cash versus stock compensation? Yeah. So, you know, as you mature as a company, you do switch more to cash versus um, equity, but your executives, you still want them heavily incentivized for um, equity. Um, and you do realize too, there are certain countries around the world that just don't value equity that you need to do um, cash. I think one of the things about switching away from options, that is a huge value or huge um, concern and issue when you grant options at a certain price and the person who joins the next day if your stock price has gone down, that they have a much lower strike price because the last thing you want to do is revalue your uh, or reprice your options. Um, we give pretty much RSUs to people. And when we grant RSUs, we do it based upon a, this is the fair value of what we're giving you. And then obviously we do the, the, the price. We did have an issue in when the initial drop in um, the markets we did go back and look at all the people who had joined in that period of time who did not have any of the pre-IPO equity. And we did do a special one-time grant based upon performance. So it was not a spreadsheet that got people automatically got equity. Um, we looked at performance and we did a special one-year um, vesting grant for people to true them back up until we could get into our normal um, refresh cycle. And we only like to do refresh grants once a year for people. And it's, um, we try to hit 40 to 50% of the people. It's not peanut butter spreading. It's based upon performance. And, and the way I look at stock-based comp is I focus more on the dilution versus the actual stock-based comp expense, because at the end of the day, the stock-based comp expense is an accounting term. And at the end of the day, investors care more about dilution um, and so I look at dilution and I've always tried to, I try to target, we're still growing um, very fast. I try to target as close to 2% dilution while growing as, um, and over time, I'd love to get that down to 1%, but that'll be when our growth rate slows down. 
Um, and over time, you can offset your dilution through buyback. We announced a buyback, a $2 billion share buyback. We talked about our last earnings call. Why? Because we're generating significant cash. I realize one of the reasons we generate significant cash is because of the stock-based comp that we do, that we forego, give, we had foregone um, cash compensation for people. Um, and we're, we're switching that, but we're using all of our free cash flow over the next two years to buy back stock. And why am I doing that? You may say, isn't there a more efficient use of your capital? We're sitting on $5 billion in capital, and our business is not one that's going to do a lot of big M&A. They're all small M&As that I can just fund through cash flow as well, too. So the, just so people understand, the dilution target is you're saying 2% a year. So if you had 100 shares outstanding, you're only giving out two new shares to yes. employees a year. Correct. A very low number relative to basically yeah. almost all. And, and I said target is two. We're actually probably more around two and a half, two point six this year. But depending on performance management, I could get that down. But many other companies, Salesforce and others, are probably you know 10, 20 percent. It's a big. They're, I don't know if they're that high, but they're definitely higher than us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've always been very. We, you know, I always tell employees too is you got to spend money like it's your own money. Mm -hmm. um, within the company and we and this is why I say Frank and I are, Frank very much thinks this way too um, I've never had a CEO like Frank expenses next to nothing in the company he just he spends money like it's his own and he is very good about that and he's like this is investor money it's the same thing too that he and I feel very strongly about this is that you know we're not a charitable organization um, in terms of this is our investor money. We don't give through the company a lot of things to different charities and stuff. We do some, but what I will say is, I know Frank does a lot personally. I do a lot personally. And I think our, my investors, I know my big ones do a lot personally. I think that is a personal decision. It doesn't mean we don't do things in the company. I'll give you an example. What we've done in the company is when the George Floyd and Black Lives Matter and all that was bubbling up. We said, fine, employees wanted the company to do something. We said, fine, we as an executive team will match whatever the employees do in the company up to a cap. They didn't even come close to the cap. When the Ukraine crisis hit, the company, employees wanted us to do something. We're like, fine, we'll do, we will match up to um, the, the number we gave, we'd say we'd match up to 50,000 per executive we'll commit to doing. And I know a number of executives did 100,000 plus. The employees didn't even come close to that. Hmm. So that's a fascinating way of uh, having people have skin in the game. Which well, leads it's to the same thing with salespeople, too. When salespeople want you to support the CIO's charity to do stuff, and I'm like, fine, I'll do half. You can do the other half. <laughs> that's a very good point. Uh, we have a question from uh, the, the audience about uh, and elaborate on that in terms of your management leadership style. You've talked about uh, some of these things already. H how would you characterize your management leadership style? I'm very transparent and direct. Um, we're, we have a pretty flat organization. Um, I have a lot of direct reports, but um, I also do, I believe in. Um, Communication is the key to running successful businesses. Um, I'm the one that has forced people. I just told all my directs today, expect you in here four days a week. Um, and, um, um, and then the initial thing is then people are like, well, does that mean all of our employees are four days a week? And I said, no. I said, you are in four days a week. It's your choice what to do with your people. But if you don't see the value of being in person, I question your judgment. So you have everyone coming in four days a week now? I do. I just yeah. started that today. And my today? Func my functions, and I have a lot of, I have legal, I have um, my directs. I have legal, I have IT, I have our security, I have HR, I have a bunch of stuff on the sales finance side and deals desk and stuff. And I just, I, 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 it's funny, and you can actually see it in the Snowflake data too across companies is, you know, during the early days of COVID, everything was locked down. Your kids weren't going out. Everyone was home. You had nothing to do. You worked. And it's funny, you see it in the daily, because I can see daily our revenue and I can look historically and I can see even on weekends, our revenue was higher relative to other days. 
today, I see, and a lot of companies are Tuesdays to Thursdays in the office or other days, you see the, the usage of Snowflake, and this is our customer base around the world. Tuesdays, Wednesdays is the spike, the highest Thursdays, and Mondays and Fridays drop off, and the weekends drop to kind of that base rate that is really just to schedule jobs. So it tells us how people are working. So your point is, if your customers were working, they'd be using Snowflake on Mondays and Fridays. The fact Correct. that low usage means they're actually not working. And if they're not working, it means my employees and I just want people to work a solid 40 hours a week. Yeah, there you go. I'm not asking people to work the same number of hours as everyone. Just put 40 hours in at least of real work. And by the way, commuting to work is not working. Yeah, good point. Well, Mike, you talked about the roles, the functions besides finance that you're you're leading. And of course, one key uh, role any finance leader has is interacting with sales and marketing uh, or generally the revenue functions. Uh, one question from someone in our audience talks about uh, the, their experience with disconnected silos where finance is here and marketing there is there and sales is there. How And the finance is more quantitative, revenue people are more qualitatively typically. If you were going to go into a new company today and you found that the company didn't have data and visibility how, what would you do to try to break down these silos? I don't know if you've done it actually before or, or whether you... Well, I'll, I'll tell you the number one thing is to use Snowflake and have all your data in one, <laughs> in one location. That's oh, that was a layoff. I didn't realize that. I was and, and that. By the way, we do that. <laughs> but, you know, I, when I joined Snowflake, there were silos in terms of people did not communicate. And that's why I went back to it's important to be in person to communicate. And I think we have very tight alignment between sales and finance and IT and others. Um, we used to have that everyone in the company could procure whatever SaaS application they wanted. There was no, I really chain. And why this is so important is when sales procures a SaaS application, the chances are it actually impacts finance or another group or same thing with marketing. And so I believe in having a really strong central IT function um, that is involved, and it's super important from a security standpoint today, too, that you want to understand when you're procuring a software that is it's maybe a cloud software, but that could be uh, impact your supply chain. And if there's a security incident there, how's it going to affect your company and potentially your customers? And so I believe you have to have tight alignment. It doesn't mean IT is driving what we're using. We'll listen to the business, but that decision to buy something has to go through my CIO, which comes up through me and all procurement the company goes through uh, my central procurement organization. Nothing can be bought in the company without going through my central procurement. On the sales piece in particular, it really takes work as a finance person to be engaged with sales, understand. I spent, when I first joined the company, I spent so much time, as much time, with the sales organization as I did with the finance. And even to today, I have regular one-on-one -on -one meetings with our CRO, with the head of sales ops. I actually own a bunch of the stuff you may have seen traditionally in sales ops, like all the deals desk, sales finance. I actually have finance people that help the salespeople structure the deals in front of customers. I am very much in front of customers as well, too. So I think the, to break down those silos, you have to be proactive and reach out to them, build up that trust and partnership. It's it's interesting. I actually just, I have a, um, a, a really, really strong person in my finance organization that wants to be a CFO one day, and he will be a CFO one day at a company. Um, and um, I literally just before this, I just had a conversation with him. There's tension between him and my CRO. And this goes back from before I joined the company and it just bubbled up again last week. And I just went into him and I said, you need to understand that you want to be a CFO of a company one day. Any company you go to, if they're any good, they're going to do a background check, a backdoor check with the head of sales at Snowflake and ask their opinion of you. And if you don't have a good relationship, that's going to reflect poorly. I know I would do that if I was trying to hire someone because it is super important that the CFO and the um, and the CRO are very tightly aligned. And when I was at um, ServiceNow and Data Domain, there was an individual, Dave Schneider. 
he and I have a great relationship. Doesn't mean we didn't agree all the time. We actually got into many heated arguments, but we always walked out of that room aligned. And that's actually something that Frank really taught us is you have to be willing to have hard conversations. And those hard conversations, um, you need to be very direct and do them at our staff meetings so we understand the conflict so we can get it resign or resolved. But when we leave that staff meeting, we all have to be behind the tip of the spear, as he likes to talk about it, Frank, and driving sales, and we're all aligned on what we're going to do. There can't be any disagreement, because if there's disagreement at this level, it's going to create all kinds of issues within the employee base of the company. And so that is really, really important as a finance person that you get. You may disagree, but you have to be aligned. Mike, that's a fascinating example. Can you, can you give uh, a, an example of a, an a, an issue that you had with or head revenue head where you ended up agreeing with them and the decision was to go with the head of revenue and then another example where they sort of compromised and the decision was to go with you. Well, I would say I'm a strong personality, so most have gone can kind of come <laughs> my way. <laughs> I have some real examples I've been working on right now, but I don't want to, I, I actually, I don't want to publicly say what those things are, if that's okay. But, but how, how do you, you know, if you're going to win most of the time, how do you persuade the head of revenue to go your way if it's a persuasion? Data. Dictator? Data. It's all about the data. You, data doesn't lie. Okay. Uh, is it usually about pricing or is it about... No, you, you know, know what, are the, I, what are the key I, issues that come up? I have... A, a, pr pricing is one. It's really opening new markets. A lot of it is on the timing of opening new markets. Um, pricing is somewhat, but usually you can quickly come to resolution on pricing. Yeah. Um um commitments you're willing to make with customers there have been some things that have caused some issues not at snowflake but historically mm -hmm. um issues on um um alliances teams you know i'm not a huge um um you know a lot of company customer success is another one creating those organizations um you, you know Salespeople, you could measure what they do mm -hmm. because they generate POs with customers. Alliances really, it's hard to measure the value of the alliances team. Mm -hmm. And so that's generally where I'd have a lot of disagreements. And I know Frank kind of thinks similar to me on that. That's again, that alignment. Creating a customer success organization. I've had issues with this where sales doesn't think they need to own it. And we believe, and I think it's in Frank's book as well, too, um, is that um, everyone in the company needs to own customer success. So why do I need a separate organization to do that? Hmm. Doesn't mean we don't care about customer success, but right. everyone needs to own customer success. Right. Mm -hmm. And in a consumption model, and this is a dispute that I've had with our head of sales here, because the first thing I did when I joined the company is these sales compensation used to be just you do a booking, the rep gets paid their commission and they move on to the next deal. And right. I'm like, no, 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 no. A, you've oversold customers and you're giving them unlimited rollover. That doesn't make sense. These commissions we've been paying and B, I need customers to consume. I need them to actually migrate to Snowflake and drive to so I can recognize revenue. I need the salespeople to continue to be involved in that customer relationship. So switch the comp that they get paid part up front and part on monthly on revenue consumption. So it's, it's, is it half on booking and half on consumption? On average, on average it's half. It changes based upon the, whether you have a big installed base or you have one big customer that is um, doing 50 million in revenue and there may only be a small amount of um, growth opportunities. So they could go anywhere from kind of 90, 10, 90 on growth to 10 on consumption to 10 on growth and uh, or 90 or 10 on growth and 90 on consumption. It really varies based upon the opportunity the rep has. Well, how do you deal with, uh, if you add up all the booking that people think is going to turn into revenue and then it doesn't turn into revenue? Because these aren't, are these, are, are these contractual bookings? Or they're, these... They're, they're contractual bookings. Oh, okay. So you get paid on, uh, you, you're guaranteed to get it eventually. Yeah, eventually we're guaranteed together. But the way that I do it, and this is a very unique model that I never had, you know, in the, my days of data domain, you ship a product and you get the revenue and then you have a subscription for the support. And the days of service now is SaaS, you sign a contract and it's ratable recognition. You go into a quarter and you know 
97% of the, your revenue. It's the easiest business to forecast a, a, a SaaS company. And in Snowflake's case, you literally start a quarter with zero revenue. Now, the reality is, is you know, customers are going to use it because it would take them a long time to get off of it. But we have built, in, and this was built before my time in the company, um, I actually have a data science team within my FP&A organization, which I've never had before. And they're not accountants, they're data scientists. They have, through machine learning models, looking at historical patterns within our customers, I literally forecast revenue on a per customer basis for the year and by the day. And um, that gets reforecast. Those models are refreshed daily to give me a new snapshot of what my forecast revenue is going to be compared to plan by customer. So I can see every day exactly what customers are over consuming, what are under consuming. And I can do, I can see through my visualization layer, I have a graph literally that shows what is my forecast revenue and my models. And it shows the weekends, how it drops, holidays. And then I have another line to show how am I trending. And as long as I'm trending above that line, I'm doing well relative to my internal forecast. And I've okay. never had that visibility in a company before. And I rely so much on my data science team. That's that's a very valuable. If you have a customer who you think is going to use a million dollars worth of your service over the course of a year, and you sign, let's say, an $800,000 contract, to, and then there's a little bit of an o- overage, that creates friction relative to signing a hundred thousand dollar contract and still thinking he's gonna that that customer will use a million dollars because they have to make such a big upfront commitment. Is have you thought about that trade off? Did you? Yeah. So to- so we we give customers complete flexibility, by the way. And okay. so typically, a sales rep is incented to get a customer to sign a one year commitment or a three year commitment with an annual payment in, in advance. We give customers the flexibility in our pricing table to you can do uh, if obviously if you sign a three-year contract you pay annually in advance you're going to get your best deal depending on the volume it can be better Um, if you want to you're willing to sign a three-year contract but you want quarterly payment terms or monthly in arrears you're going to get a different discount you want to go to the ultimate flexibility is we allow customers to go into on demand where they make no commitment and they just pay monthly in arrears and then what does the salesperson get on a no commitment deal? No commitment deal. A salesperson gets paid month. They get paid um, the following month after the revenue was recognized on the consumption piece. So they don't get any estimated. Revenue. They don't get anything that's, that's estimated. Not, that's not your philosophy. Interesting. It's not our philosophy. And yeah. by the way, even if you, if you sign a deal that has deferred payment terms, your upfront payment gets deferred as well, too. Ah, okay. So it's 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 a cash. You you get paid on revenue unless there's an unusual deferral, and then you get paid later. Correct. Fascinating. So uh, we're about, about to wrap up, Mike, and I have two last questions that I'd like to that I'd like to ask all of our guests. What's the best advice anyone has given you? You know, literally the best advice I ever received early in my career was, and it was a young partner at Cooper's and Library, and Eric Demarian, and he told me, he said, Mike. Just put your head down and do your work and let your work speak for itself. You don't need to tell people all the great things you're doing. And I've lived by that motto my whole life. I've never asked, and asked Frank, I've never asked him for anything other than my initial contract. <laughs> that's uh, that's tremendous advice and clearly it's worked for you. If you were going to write a CFO playbook, what's one thing CFOs practically can do tomorrow morning to help their companies or or in their personal life? You know, I think the the number one thing is instilling a culture in the company where there's cross-functional communication happening. I see too many companies where the CFO or different groups are just not communicating and sharing what they're doing. And so um, I think that is um, really, really important. And I think the way that Frank runs his weekly exec staff meeting is We have open dialogue of what's going on in the company. And I always do my staff meeting the day after Frank's executive staff meeting. So I can feed down from that what's happening in the company with everyone. So all of my people know what's going on. And I have a, I, I also think too, that is a really important thing as a CFO 
is I do a lot of I do a lot of one-on-ones with people that are the direct reports into my direct reports mm -hmm. because I want to know what's going on in the company. And I don't want that filter through my direct reports. That's two, 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 two for the price of one, two great practical yeah. suggestions, <laughs> having skip level one-on-ones and then also having a, instilling a culture of cross-functional communications and doing it by cascading. You know, when, when, things, when you hear about things, then the next day, share that yeah. with your team and presumably they share it with their team. Yeah. Well, Mike, it's, it's been a real pleasure talking to you today. Lots of fascinating stories and learning for all of us. We very much appreciate it. It's well, great. thank you for having me.